The gi strap. You might think putting a strap around your neck that somebody could grab and yank you around by is a really bad idea. But is it the liability it first appears to be? Let's find out. Let's start with some historical context. Gi straps appear in artwork all throughout the medieval period, from the Battle of Hastings up and into the Renaissance. They were very common features and are commonly depicted being worn as the shield is being used, not just for transport. Even the medieval poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight spends time describing Gawain using his gige. The shield they showed him then, a flaming gall so red, there the pentacle shines, and pure gold burnished. On baldric bound, the shield he to his neck makes tight. Full well, I ween, that sign became the comely knight. And swift he sprang aside, more than a spear length's throw, with speed his helmet good upon his head set fast. His trusty shield and true, he over his shoulders cast, drew forth his brand so bright, and fiercely spake away. But enough of that, it's time to get a little sweaty. Now the trade-off of using the gige is stability in exchange for mobility, but is the game's stability enough to offset somebody yanking you about by that shield? Do you build enough structure to not just be pulverized? For the purposes of this test, I'm gonna let my clubmate yank me about by the shield in three different configurations. Once, with just the hand strap and gige, with the hand strap and arm strap, and with the hand strap, arm strap, and gige. The trick here is that I'm bearing against the gige to stabilize the shield. The lack of an arm strap makes the shield a little easy to flip up, but it doesn't compromise body structure. The gige is providing good resistance to any attempt to grapple with the forward edge of the shield. But once again, the back edge is a bit vulnerable. Without the extra stability from the gige, Ben is having a much easier time opening the shield up in any direction he pleases. Here we're testing to see if he can actually pull me away by the shield, and while he's not pulling me away, he is creating a huge opening. Again, some very big openings being created here. This position has the most straps involved, so it's no surprise that he is having a harder time displacing the shield. We're about to try that pull again, and you can see that the strap being around my neck does actually give him enough leverage to pull me towards him. Those were manipulations with one hand on the shield, but what about getting two hands on a weapon and using it to hook and wrench? Keep this first wrench in mind when he tries it again without the gige. Check out how the shape of that shield is actually deflecting his attempts to hook and glancing it off and down the rim. Once again, without the gige, these wrenches are even more amplified now that he's doing it with two hands rather than the one. Unfortunately, hooking with the crosshair was about the best we could do at the time. If I repeated this, I would definitely get a better tool for the job, but I think in comparison between all three, it's really driving home just how much more stable this shield configuration is than either of the previous two, with how little he's able to move it with doing the exact same hooking actions he's been using up to this point. My takeaway from this experimentation was that the arm strap shield was far and away the easier one for the opponent to manipulate. The arm straps essentially give your opponent free reign to manipulate your entire arm as though they have grasped your elbow via the size of the shield. Now, manipulating the elbow is a common feature in grappling because via the elbow you can essentially turn the whole body. So this is a lot of control to afford to your opponent if they can get close enough to use it. It was also my observation that given enough time and pressure, they could eventually, yes, pull you towards them via the strap around your neck. However, you have a large shield, and if they start pulling you towards them, stop resisting it and push back into it. You can very quickly shove this into their entire space, and it becomes a lot harder for them to do anything once they have a shield blocking most of their vision and pinning their arms. Now in those last clips, I was letting Ben just kind of yank around the shield as he pleased, while I just tried to keep it in the same spot, seeing how strong the position was. But what if I didn't let him do that, and I actually met him with reprisal? Starting off here, we're doing some static exploration. He's grabbing the shield, and I'm just doing the first counter that comes to mind. We're not really too dynamic yet, but as we go through this, we'll start to become a little more spontaneous and creative with how we're taking this approach. Bearing in mind the fact that we're not outright sparring, we're trying to create situations that will lead to a shield grapple that we can then work off of. In this next exchange, we get the best example I have of almost being undone by that neck strap. You can see him buckle me over, but I managed to pull my sword up to cover that line he creates and still land the thrust. And here, although he manages to eventually twist that shield up, I'm able to keep pushing it towards him and still clear that line from my own sword. So like, yeah, you can get control of the shield's position 
But you getting control of the shield's position is not you getting control of me. Yeah, no, no. So like, you, you can open the shield up, but because I'm so secured by the gauge and the strap, it doesn't matter where this is going, I still have control over myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my opinion that successful manipulations of the shield are very brief affairs. A quick yank and wrench to create an opening that you can exploit. Anything more than that is creating a window of opportunity for the person with the shield to try to basically just accept that you are not doing anything that's immediately threatening to them and they can do whatever they need to to stop you. There are also some mitigating factors here, namely that most people are right-handed. So if you have a right-handed shieldsman versus a right-handed shieldsman, that weapon hand is facing that shield arm and you don't necessarily have a free hand to grapple with that shield. Now, of course, you can try to use your own shield for manipulations, but that's sort of a different beast. Now, maybe they have an axe, but wrenching only gets you but so far. And as we observed earlier, adding the guige gives you a degree of protection from those wrenches. What if you wanted to drop the shield and switch to hands and your sword? Does this become a liability? This sword arm wrap is one of my favorite techniques. I use it all the time. Keep an ear out here for my shield actually passively protecting me. Did you hear it? I'm trying very hard to keep him from getting a slice here. I told you I like that arm wrap. Yeah, because like, you know, if, if it's right hand versus right hand, and we go from the shield being loose yeah. into a grapple, it becomes a grapple here, and because that's your sword hand, and that's your grab hand, My hand. this is the shield out of play. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And in order, if, if for this shield to get into play, I have to be in a really bad situation relative to you. Because if, if you're able to get back there, I'm in trouble. Maybe the thing I can do is reach across. So let's say that I end up. <laughs> yeah. But that's hard. It's not like that. No. I mean, it's. Yeah, especially if I'm, like, I wouldn't want to smack myself in the face with that, but, like, if I'm wearing, like, armor, like, I don't care. Like, so what? Yeah. I feel like with armor on, you hurt enough quite a lot. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't feel, like, I'm barely aware of the stress at all. That's actually really cool, because, I mean, that side, it, it turns that side. Yeah. I, sure, I can even, I can even block, I just, yeah, yeah. So I, don't even have to, I don't even have to hold it, I can just, and then engage with the sword. When it gets to a grapple with a shield loose like this, circling back to handedness, their dominant weapon hand is going to again be on the same side as the loose shield. This shield, as soon as you get into a grapple, is probably going to slip out to the side and generally be not quite immediately accessible. Now, of course, there's the strap here, but in the moment of trying to get for this strap that's already tight to the body, they have to get past this hand and your active weapon hand and you're going to be doing some degree of offense on your own part trying to wrest that away. And time spent going for your shield is time that you, as the shield's men, have opportunities in which to counter grapple and work off of whatever they're doing. So it's just sort of wasted time on their part. Once you have even a baseline level of protection on, the amount of pressure this strap is applying to your neck is largely unnoticed, and it's not terribly unpleasant to have swooping around. While this was by no means a definitive test of the geese strap, hopefully we were able to create enough scenarios to show you the effects of the geese and its absence on the same situations, and hopefully inform your own opinions of the geese a little bit better. My personal takeaway from this was that I thought the geese added significantly more stability than not having it, and made the shield far harder to open up. And really the concern for me is opening that shield up to weapon attacks, more so than being manipulated by it. Those quick yanks to expose an opening that you can attack, that's what scares me the most about the shield, and that's what the Gij best shuts down.